Hello and welcome to this review redux of my Cherry G80 9009. I've reviewed this keyboard before, about three and a half years ago, but at the time I couldn't get it working on a computer because I didn't own the controlling box required to convert it to a PC, which was a bit of a shame because that's missing out on the most fun parts of it. As a result of not being able to genuinely use it, I also refrained from giving an actual verdict on the switches, and haven't since either. But now, I got one working, which I'll show you in a bit how it goes, and I'll finally be telling you my opinion on Cherry MX Clear as well, which is about bleeding time, in it. Ever since the original review, I've had several people trying to help me to get this to work. The first one was a viewer who was generous enough to not only send an original switching unit, but actually another keyboard to use it with, a slightly newer model even, an AK-125, while the other one, the one I originally reviewed, is an AK-124, as Reuters called them. Unfortunately, there was a problem with the converter box, because it ran off of mains power through this adapter, and as soon as I plugged it in, a loud buzzing sound came from it, which was bad enough that I was afraid it was going to explode. Maybe I was being paranoid, but you know, once you've had a keyboard catch fire on you once, you're really not anxious to have it happen again. So unfortunately, I was stuck again, but then much later someone made me some converter cables for use with it, and now it works. Specifically, the newer one, the AK-125, sent for donation works. The old AK-124 I bought myself powers on, but is completely stuck in three modes at once and doesn't respond to anything whatsoever. So thanks to the combined efforts of both these viewers, I can now finally show a working one to you in all its glory. Thanks again, guys! Here's what the cables look like on the inside. Much to my surprise, it doesn't have a chip or anything in it. It's just a pin switch, including some shorted ones. Not sure how this all technically works, but it does. Curiously, the keyboard only works through my PS2 port. It doesn't work through a Saurus converter like this. I'm not sure why or how, as I'd expect a Saurus to be able to make sense of anything that would output scan codes that a PS2 port could read, but maybe it's a power issue or something, who knows. Also, it only works if you first power on the keyboard, like this with my very useful foot switch below the table, then switch it to desk PC mode, which is here. First you wait for it to say Reuters and stuff like that. Then you switch to desk PC. As such, and now you can see the lock LED burning. And then you switch on the computer. And then and only then will it recognize the keyboard. Reuters is a company probably most well known nowadays in its original role as a news agency, but in actuality the vast majority of its income now derives from financial market data, and it's in this capacity that this keyboard was developed, as the model sticker on the back proudly boasts, for Reuters by Cherry. So that means that this is not just an MX-based Reuters-badged keyboard, but a bespoke product made by Cherry themselves. You'll notice that the model number is actually G80-9039, rather than 9009, as this is a newer model, although it's generally still just referred to as a 9009. The trading aspect becomes apparent quickly enough when you look at the keycaps. It's got all sorts of special function keys that only really make sense in a financial context, such as all these order buttons here, what appears to be end contract, and a big fat accept button here at the top. And on the other side, we have cancel orders, bid, offer, ideal, another Obama button, and the big fat yours and mine buttons, which I just find really funny for some reason. The keycaps have a very interesting two-tone green and kind of pink or tuna color scheme, which is pretty well known as there is also a custom keycap set modeled after this called simply GMK9009. Interestingly, although they're made by a different company now, the tooling used to make them is exactly the same. And that is because GMK used Cherry's old machines to make double shot keycaps, which these originals are as well. Lovely thick ABS double shots with bold crisp lettering. And the keycaps with LED windows in them are also double shot, but it's not the lettering that shot, but the LED windows. The lettering is pad printed on top. Strangely enough, even the weird custom keys, like the yours and mine buttons, are double shots. I found that oftentimes companies tend to pad print non-standard keycaps like this instead, to save money, but not these ones. Impressive. And that's not all that's impressive. This keyboard has quite a lot of extra stuff bolted onto it, including this big-ass LCD screen, which is obviously a bit of a centerpiece. <laughs> Literally. 
It's not super bright, but it works fine. I'll get to it in more detail later when I show you what you can do with the keyboard. The size is also rather impressive, not surprising perhaps considering the amount of buttons. 149, five more than even the Ortec Battlecruiser, and that one has 48 F keys. It's just over 50 centimeters by 25 centimeters wide and deep, and about seven centimeters tall, which is more than tall enough to not fit into my monitor stand. And obviously it's rather heavy too, at 2.3 kilos, so yeah, it's kind of a beast or an imperial measurement unit, a corn-fed country boy. The electronics inside differ a bit between the two versions as well. The older AK-124, the real 9009, uses normal soldered through components, while the 9039, which is the AK-125, uses surface mounted electronics instead, and it lacks the built-in fuse that the older model had too. I've only been able to find QWERTY based models of this keyboard with an ISO style enter key, and it's one of the models where Cherry's article codes appear to be either wrong or at least inconsistent. This model is a HAG, which would mean it's got Cherry MX black switches, which it doesn't, it uses Cherry MX clear, and the other one is a HAAUS, which would additionally mean it's US ANSI, which it obviously isn't, although it's not a UK layout model like the HAG is either. I think it just means US ISO in this case. The custom GMK keycap sets do have ANSI keycaps though. Although a portion of the weight comes from extra components such as the screen and beeper, yes it has a beeper, the build quality of the keyboard is pretty impressive. The main key area here has PCB mount keys which is a little bit disappointing, but all the upper keys are mounted in a steel plate and the case is exceptionally thick and heavy. It's all rather uncherry actually. Most cherry keyboards have really shit build quality, but like last week's all metal cherry keyboard, the UB88, this one is definitely an exception. The keyboard doesn't have all the functions it would have if it were wired up through the original box, but there is still a good amount that it can do. The special trading keys don't register any scan codes that PS2 can understand, so without the box I don't think they can be reprogrammed computer side, but keyboard side it has 12 programmable macro keys that can hold up to 80 characters each, which is F13 to F24 and the control and shift keys plus F13 to F24 can be used to program additional macros, so in total that's 36 programmable function keys. Nice. Now one thing that's nice about having such a big screen on your keyboard is that it can tell you exactly what to do, so you don't even need a manual. So if you switch from desk PC to setup, like so, it tells you exactly how to program a macro. First, let's select macro definition with enter, then delete an old macro. So we go down, delete key, let's delete F13. Really delete F13, confirm with return. Now we go to program key F13, enter soft key name of F13, that's just what you want to call it, let's say T-E-S-T, -E confirm with return, and then enter the desired macro, okay, so S-P-L-O-O-G-E, for example, and confirm with F13, bam, and then it writes it to memory, and done. See, this is the kind of user friendliness that I like to see. The memory is flash based too, so it remembers your macros even if you power down or unplug the keyboard without the need for a backup battery. And of course, a nice touch is that the keyboard actually shows you your macro layout on the screen. And you can input everything you want, letters, capitals, symbols, function keys, etc, no problem. One thing of note is that while you're programming the macro, the key inputs are sent to your computer, so just have something innocuous like a text editor or a testing utility or something open when you program the macro so you don't mess anything up accidentally. Additionally, there's a calculator mode which you can access via the, you guessed it, calc button over here. In this mode, it doesn't send any scan codes to the PC, so you can calculate all you want without fucking up anything PC side. You can use either the numpad or the normal number keys, and it has all kinds of operators, not just the ones on the numpad, but also the F keys for special operators, such as square root, exponent, it's got memory keys, which are super useful, and my personal favorite, the inverse key. You can even erase inputs with the backspace key. 
The weird thing about it is that it always shows several decimal points, even if you don't define them. But overall, it's top-notch, really good. The only thing I can think that would be cool is if they added a way to output the results to the PC, but to my knowledge, there's no way of doing that, or at least not with this cable. The availability of a calculator on a keyboard might sound strange to some people, and indeed it's pretty rare, but as my long-term viewers will know, it's neither the first nor the only keyboard to have come with such a feature. Keyboard calculators were pioneered by Focus Electronic, who began putting them on many of their more upmarket offerings, such as this FK3001, as early as the late 80s. Perhaps the most well-known calculator keyboard is their FK9000 KeyPro keyboard, which is a not uncommon vintage Alps-based offering that comes with a calculator, as well as 12 programmable function keys, like the 9009. Its calculator has almost all the same functions as the 9009's, but it can display fewer characters and is much less reliable, being highly prone to failure as a matter of fact. The programmable function keys are also not as good, they can only store a dozen or so inputs per key and there's no separate layers for them, and although there is a nice little repositionable shortcut card holder for you to write your macros on, it's of course not as nice as a screen that keeps it up to date for you all the time. The Focus also only had two key rollover, while the 9009 has full N key rollover. Considering the Focus was a consumer product with a relatively low budget price tag and the 9009 was custom made for a massive company, I wouldn't be surprised if the 9009 cost 10 times as much as the Focus, but the difference in quality is obvious. So the keyboard are solid, now what about the switches? Well, as I mentioned, it comes with Cherry MX Clear, which are a fairly stiff tactile switch, and these have some interesting properties. It's fundamentally similar to Cherry MX Brown, which was developed specifically as a low-force alternative to this switch, but the two feel a bit different due to two of the parts. First of all, the notch in the slider, which is the part that generates the tactility in both switches, is different. In MX Brown, the notch is shallower, as I hope you can make out in this shot. The one on MX Clear is deeper, and this leads to a bigger tactile bump. However, as you can see in this force curve comparison, it's also much more smeared out and less sharp than MX Brown. It leans a little bit towards switches like Topra or another rubber dome keyboard in terms of the feel of the tactility than of a typical mechanical key switch as a result. It's not really rounded in truth, but it's less sharp for sure. Second, they put a spring in that's much stiffer, so much so that it bottoms out at as much as 95 grams, or in Imperial units, <laughs> This gives it a very unique feel, because for most tactile switches, the bottom-out force is fairly comparable, sometimes even lower than the peak tactile force. But in this case, there's a 30 gram gap between the two, which is massive. The result of these two is, first of all, that a tactile bump doesn't actually feel more pronounced than that of MX Brown, in my opinion. Different, maybe, but not explicitly stronger the way, for example, a Matthias Quiet Switch or Box Royal would. The tactile drop is overall bigger, but is more drawn out and the stiff weighting partly obscures it. I've long said that this type of notch-generated tactility is very limited in what it can achieve, and this is an excellent example of that. A popular mod is to swap the spring for a lighter spring, such as from MX Brown, to create a combo known as Ergo Clear, which does indeed feel slightly more pronounced, but is ultimately bound by the same limitations in my opinion, and not a fundamental improvement. The second consequence is that after the tactile bump, the switch suddenly becomes really quite stiff, and this can lead to tired hands pretty quickly if you're not used to it, I've found. That said, this is considered by many to be a feature because it makes it easier to avoid bottoming out, or at least bottoming out hard, on your switches. So, it's an ergo thing, basically. Which is kind of ironic when you consider that they developed the lighter MX Brown specifically as an ergonomic alternative to MX Clear, but <laughs> whatever. During the testing period, I tried to use these a bit softly to experience this non bottom outy feel, and I definitely can, but it's just not my thing, really. For me, the bottom-out feel is an integral part of the key feel, so if I don't get it, it feels like the key travel is incomplete somehow. I'm sure you can get used to it, but it's just not my bag.
This does leave MX Clear in a somewhat uncomfortable position with me, as no matter how much I dislike MX Brown for its near total lack of tactility, at least it's light, which this switch can't boast of, and in real terms there's no genuine improvement to the tactility in my opinion. So, in a way, I think this is worse than MX Brown, but at the same time, this does have something that more closely resembles a genuine function, so I don't feel like being as harsh on it, whereas from my perspective, there's no real point to MX Brown at all. Of course, though, as always, your mileage may vary. There's plenty of people who like MX Browns and Clears, after all. This is just my opinion. Anyway, overall it's a very nice keyboard to use, with great features, excellent build quality and a nice look to boot. The switches really aren't my thing though, and unfortunately most keys are PCB man, so I can't just swap them for box click bar switches or something either, which is a huge shame. I mean, I'm normally not really a big fan of hard modding special old keyboards like this, but maybe just soft swapping the top housing, stems and springs for, I don't know, cream switches would be good? Unfortunately, considering it's PS2 only, I doubt I'll ever be able to use it at work. That's it for this review. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. And following is a typing demonstration of me typing on this keyboard.